complete our discussion of social categorization today. Remember we began with Roger Brown's list of not what he called natural categories of persons, and one thing we discovered as we went through the nature of some of these categories is that they're not so natural. That is, a lot of these social categories don't exist in nature independent of the mind of the perceiver, but rather they seem to be constructed in large part either by individuals or by social groups to serve various, uh, various kinds of, uh, of purposes. Uh, one type of so, uh, natural category of person that we haven't discussed yet, only going to discuss it for about 38 seconds, is uh, categories in local culture, which simply means the kinds of, stereot the, the, the kinds of person categories that people have in, um, in various uh, localities or as members of various groups. If you go on answers.com and you enter uh, high school stereotypes, you get a list like this, okay, uh, where high schoolers are divided into preps and goths and emos and punks and jocks and nerds, and there are even subcategories of things like true prep preps versus preppy snobs and prep wannabes. These are social categories, and we can laugh at them, but we all use these categories, or at least we did when we were in high school. Uh, going to college, it's not all that different. Every fraternity, every sorority on campus has a reputation about what a typical member of that fraternity or sorority is. If you live or work or teach or study at Harvard, you know that Harvard undergraduates don't, have, don't live in fraternities and sororities, they live in houses but each house has a reputation in terms of the kind of person uh, who lives there. There's no random assignment to these houses, unlike the Yale colleges where there is random assignment, and the Yale colleges don't have such reputations. At Princeton, there are the eating clubs, and they again have reputations as to which kind of person uh, belongs to them. So if you're, if, you're, if you're at Harvard and somebody says, where do you live, and you say, I live at Adam's house, they know a lot about you or at least they think they do, which brings us to the matter of stereotyping, okay? Uh, stereotyping classically defined by Walter Lippmann, who you probably know mostly as a journalist, but who was actually a scholar of political science, as an oversimplified picture of the world, one that satisfies the need to see the world as more understandable than it really is. Uh, David Hamilton at University of California, Santa Barbara, a cognitive social psychologist, uh, gave a more cognitive twist to this definition. A stereotype is a cognitive structure that contains the, the perceiver's knowledge, beliefs, and expectations about a human group, about a group of people. Hamilton's definition makes it very clear that social stereotypes are forms of categories. They are categories in the social world, uh, and we can basically think of them as categories that reflect um, our conception of the character of an entire group of individuals, not our conception of some specific individual, Judy or Lucy or James Bartlett or somebody like that, but rather our conception of some group to which individuals uh, belong. And we usually think about stereotypes as, uh, as uh, being held, uh, basically being, being something that divides in groups and out groups. So for example, it's very common to think about social stereotypes as conceptions that are shared by members of an in-group, however you want to define an in-group, versus um, uh, concerning members of an out-group. So there's a real kind of us versus them quality to a lot of these social uh, categories, uh, social stereotypes. And social stereotypes as categories have many of the same functions for better or for ill that other, um, that other social categories have. So for example, having categories reduces effort in impression formation, just like having a set of categories reduces effort in perception in general. If I tell you something is a vehicle, you don't have to look too closely to see if it's got an internal combustion engine or four wheels or whatever. You kind of know what the general characteristics of a, of, of, of a vehicle are. Moreover, categories allow us to in make inferences about features that are not available to perception. Uh, so that 
if once you've categorized an object, you've categorized it based on its visible features, perhaps, but by virtue of knowing what category the object belongs to, you can retrieve from memory information about features uh, that you can't see. You can also, especially in the social domain, use categorization to make uh, uh, inferences, or better yet, predictions, about the person's uh, past or future behaviors. Now that we know what somebody, somebody's like, uh, what, what category they belong to, we have a set of expectations about what they're going to do. Social categories, of course, have two particularly interesting social functions, the first of which is that social, uh, uh, social stereotypes as social categories generally lead to some degree of prejudice and emotional uh, uh, the characterization, which leads us to think about the object of a stereotype in somewhat negative terms. Now, that's not necessarily true. There are interesting exceptions to that. But in general, stereotypes uh, are full of negative uh, the content. And it almost follows from this emotional prejudice that goes along with social stereotypes that there is behavioral discrimination, that we treat stereotyped individuals differently than we would treat people who don't possess uh, certain kinds of, uh, of stereotypes. So let's talk for a second about where stereotypes come from. Don't want to talk about this uh, a lot. There are lots of reasons for stereotyping. Sometimes stereotyping serves uh, uh, economic purposes. There's an approach to stereotyping known as realistic group conflict theory that basically says that there are groups of individuals who, co who are in competition for uh, a limited set of resources. And what stereotyping does is to aid the battle of one group over, uh, with, uh, with another one for that limited pool of, of, of resources. So um, ethnic stereotypes are especially um, uh, especially of interest to uh, people who hold this economic uh, view. More of, of, more of a psychological view is, the, uh, is, uh, is a motivational source of stereotyping. This comes straight from uh, Taj Fell and Turner's social identity uh, the theory that basically says what we want to do is to make and reinforce distinctions between us and them, or more precisely, make and reinforce distinctions between people like us however people like us is defined, and people, uh, uh, people like them. And it's not necessarily because we're competing for a limited pool of resources, but just because we want to, uh, we want to um, share in the goodies that come to our group and make sure that, uh, that our, our group is identified as a good group. Uh, then finally, well, the one we're going to focus on today are the cognitive um, uh, aspects of stereotyping. The general idea here being that stereotyping is to some extent an inevitable outcome of categorization. And if Bruner was right when he said that every act of perception is an act of categorization and stereotyping is an inevitable outcome of categorization, then it kind of uh, follows from that that some degree of stereotyping is kind of built into the process of person perception and impression formation. Walter Lippmann uh, had the idea about this. He wasn't a psychologist. He didn't talk about concepts and categories. Uh, but echoing William James, he talked about stereotypes as representing a simple model of great blooming, buzzing confusion of reality. That the world is very complicated, and stereotypes are ways of simplifying that. And of course, that's exactly what happens with categorization. Categorization is our way of simplifying, um, of simplifying the world. Again, just to remind you of stuff that you got from your cognitive psychology or cognitive science course, if you start thinking about stereotypes as categories, then you start wanting to ask questions about uh, uh, what the structure of stereotypes are and whether the structure of social stereotypes Matt, what we know about the structure of social stereotypes matches what we know about the structure of social categories, or categories in general. Again, I don't want to perseverate on this because you guys know this already, I hope, uh, but you'll remember that uh, we began uh, in psychology and philosophy and the rest of cognitive science 
with the view of categories as proper sets, the idea that categories were distinguished from each other uh, by virtue of a set of defining features that were singly necessary and jointly sufficient to define an, uh, uh, define an instance, an object as an instance of a category. All fish are cold-blooded vertebrates with scales and fins. If you've got those four properties, you're a fish. If you don't have those, prop those four properties, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not a fish. We know now, again, by virtue of the work of people like uh, uh, Berkeley's own Professor Eleanor Roche, that that model of ca categorization, mo model of category structure doesn't work very well, and that a better view is one that basically says, it's a, basically a variant on the classical view, but a, a, a variant that's importantly variant uh, in, in, uh, in important ways, that we basically have fuzzy sets. The, 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 the features that are, that are associated with category membership aren't defining features present, and each and, present in each and every instance of the category, but uh, categories are fuzzy sets, and the features that we list when we, talk, when, we, when we describe category members are only probabilistically associated with category membership. Okay, so for example, uh, birds, you, uh, your, your, your uh, a prototype view of birds is that a creature that flies, but there are some birds that don't fly. Okay, and there are some non-birds that do fly, like Rocky the flying squirrel. Um, there is also uh, an alternative exemplar view of categorization that basically says that instead of representing categories in terms of a set of features, we represent categories in terms of the instances that are in the category. If I look at an object and, and want to determine whether it's a bird, I don't determine whether it's got feathers and wings. I don't determine whether it flies. I determine whether it looks like a robin or a sparrow or a finch. And then finally, there is a theory-based view of, uh, of categorization that basically says that um, uh, categories aren't, composed, aren't defined simply in terms of lists of features that aren't related to each other, but rather we carry around in our heads a theory that relates um, features to category membership. Okay, so there's a reason why when I think about a bird, I think about a creature that flies because I have basically have a theory of the world that divides it up into things that fly and things, uh, things that, uh, that, that don't fly. When we look at the structure of social stereotypes, we discover that they are probably best thought of in terms of some combination of a prototype view of, um, of, of, of conceptual structure and an exemplar view of conceptual structure. I'll um, make that point a little bit clearer in a minute, but simply to begin that, I'll just point out that when you look at your own social stereotypes, what you have in your social stereotypes is first a list of features or traits that, that uh, ostensibly describe uh, the, some, the members of some social group, but you also have instances in your head of various group members. And in the same way that we have in our heads lists of features that are ostensibly characteristic of some social group, we also have in our heads some sense of the, vari the variability uh, of these features within group members. And in the same way that we have in our heads uh, lists of people who exemplify various social uh, uh, categories, we have uh, in our head lists of exceptions to the rule. This was beautifully illustrated the last couple of weeks, if you've been watching the news, okay, uh, by the dispute about Harry Reid, Senator Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, and his comments during the 2008 presidential campaign about Barack Obama. Uh, Mark Halpern and John Heilman report that Reid was wowed by Obama's oratorical gifts and believed the country was ready to embrace a black presidential candidate, something that country hadn't been ready to do before, especially one like Obama, a light-skinned African-American with no Negro dialect unless he wanted to have one. Now, Reed got a lot of grief for this comment. It was quite embarrassing for him. But what's interesting about it is the deep historical background here, which is that it was Harry Reid who persuaded Obama to run for the presidency to begin with. Okay? So there's no animosity on, on the part of Harry Reid towards, um, uh, towards, uh, towards Barack Obama. 
but it's very clear that Reed has in his head a stereotype about African Americans that consists of a list of features and variability, light-skinned, presumably as opposed to dark-skinned, uh, and uh, Negro dialect as opposed to non-Negro dialect, and that somehow um, there are exceptions to the, to the stereotype. And all of this is kind of wrapped up beautifully in this, uh, in this Harry Reid, um, um, Barack Obama um, episode. Okay, so let's now look at the relationship between the stereotypes we have about group members and the particular individuals that comprise these groups. And again, uh, I just want to point out that stereotypes, like all categories, have uh, both an inductive and a deductive aspect uh, to them. So, for example, when we form a category, we form a category based on our encounters with various examples of the category. If you're a three-year-old and I, we're walking down the street and I say, there's a dog and there's a dog and there's a dog and there's a dog, your little three-year-old mind is trying to figure out what all these things have in common, right? Uh, whatever it is, four legs, it has a tail, it barks, or whatever it is, you're, trying to, you're inducing the category uh, from encounters with instances of the category. So what happens when we stereotype people is we tend to attribute to an entire group the features that we perceive in a single instance of, um, of that group. And then there is a deductive aspect to, the, to uh, social stereotypes in the same way that there's a deductive aspect to any other uh, category, which is that we tend to treat the features associated with category membership as defining features, which is to say we tend to attribute to every instance the features that we um, that we associate with the group. So now let's take that and try to figure out, go, go from there to an analysis of exactly uh, uh, how, th what, what the relationship is between the features of individual members of stereotype groups and the features of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, in of, of the group as a whole. So if I say to you, Germans are very industrious people, which is a common social stereotype about Germans, uh, what do I mean by that? Do I mean that every single German on God's green earth is industrious in a way that, you know, Swiss or Swedes or something like that are not? Do I mean that most Germans are industrious? Okay, there are some exceptions, but most of them are very industrious. Uh, is it the typical German, the average German, uh, and if it is the typical German exactly, what do I mean by typical? Well, this is a question that uh, Katz and Braley and other uh, uh, the, uh, the psychologists who have studied social stereotypes in, um, uh, in detail have tried to address. This is, work done, this is a classic study of social stereotyping by uh, 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 Daniel Katz and Braley in 1933, um, comparing the American and the German uh, the, the stereotype. Um, and this is basically what it was, just to kind of get away from usual kinds of, of, of things. In 1933, people were a lot more interested in the German stereotype uh, than they are now. But if you asked Americans to list what the typical American was like, you'd get a list like this, as Katz and Braley did. And if you asked Americans to, list, to, to, uh, to say what the typical German was like, you would get a list, um, uh, you'd, you'd get a list like this. Okay, now it turns out these national stereotypes are remarkably stable. Uh, Carlins, Kaufman, and Walters repeated the Katz and Braley study in 1969. Here is the German stereotype from 1933. Here is the German stereotype from 1967. And there's quite a, still quite a bit of, uh, of overlap about, um, uh, about these kinds of uh, uh, these things. Okay, so now, again, people were asked to list the characteristics of the typical German. There were other nationalities as well. I just want to focus on Germans um, for purposes of this um, uh, exercise. Okay, what do we mean by that? Well, Macaulay and Stitt, analyzing this kind, the, 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 uh, addressing this kind of problem, uh, made use of basically Bayesian theory, and they said, well, what typical means is really determined by a couple of conditional probabilities. What um, what Macaulay and Stitt did was to take a new group of subjects, 
and ask them to list, to, to, to make a judgment of how likely it would be that a German was efficient or nationalistic or industrious or scientific or what have you, okay? And then um, asked people to list the, the, to, to make judgments about how the how these these traits apply to the typical person without respect to national uh, national stereotype. So something like efficiency, you got a probability of the trait in the population in general of about 50 percent. Okay, 50 percent of people are perceived to be efficient, but the probability of that trait, given that you're German, is considerably higher. Nationalistic. People rated uh, about 35 percent of a probability that the average person would be nationalistic, but if you're German, they would give that um, probability, increase that probability to 56.3 percent. What Macaulay and Stitt then did was to calculate a diagnostic ratio, which is basically the ratio of the probability of the trait given some nationality over the probability of the trait in general. And what they discovered was that traits go into stereotypes if this diagnostic ratio is greater than one. Okay? So you're more likely to have the trait if you're to be perceived as having the trait uh, if you're a member of a, of, of a particular group than if you're just a person uh, uh, on average. Notice here, national, um, or here, scientific, okay? Um, people don't think that the, that the majority of Germans are scientific. They don't even think the average German is scientific. What they, what they think is that if you're German, you're more likely to be scientific than if you're just an ordinary person walking down, uh, walking down the street. So these, these the, uh, traits go into stereotypes if they provide diagnostic value, if they provide extra information about what the person is going to be like. Now, of course, none of this says that Germans really are efficient or nationalistic or industrious or scientific or more efficient, nationalistic, industrious and scientific than anybody else. We're all talking here about the level of belief, okay? But when you ask how is it that traits go into a stereotype, okay, it seems to, uh, uh, traits seem to enter into a stereotype according to something like this diagnostic, uh, this diagnostic process. So stereotype traits need not be present in all members of a group. Okay, everybody recognizes that stereotypes are overbroad. Uh, stereotype traits need not even be present in the majority of group members. Okay, and in fact, stereotype traits may be l less frequent in stereotype groups than non-stereotype uh, traits so long as they are relatively more likely in group members. Again, there's this calculation. It's an intuitive calculation. People don't sit down and say, uh, well, the probability of being nationalistic if you're German is 45.8%, and the probability of being nationalistic if you're just an ordinary, if you're just a person is 33.3%. Therefore, nationalism is going to go into my, uh, the stereotype of Germans. But generally what happens is there is some intuitive calculation of relative probabilities. Traits enter into stereotypes if they're re relatively more probable to, a, to be observed in group members, either compared to members of another group or compared to a population as a whole. And then finally, it has to be understood that these probabilities are all subjective. Okay, there's no polling data going into these, uh, into, into these things. Stereotypes are beliefs about various um, groups uh, of, the, of people, but they're not necessarily accurate representations of these groups, a point to which I'll return in a minute. Okay, so that's the structure of stereotyping, of the social stereotypes. And if you think, it for, think about it for a second, this is completely consistent with the um, revisionist fuzzy set view of categorization in general, okay? So being efficient, nationalistic, industrious, and scientific, they're not singly necessary and jointly sufficient to define the category of German, okay? What people believe is they're simply characteristic of German 
people as opposed to some other uh, group of people. They tend to occur more frequently in Germans than in non-Germans, which is exactly what we would expect based on the probabilistic view of category, um, category structure. Okay, so where do these things come from? Okay, um, first, there is a, uh, a process of social learning that goes on here. Acquiring social stereotypes seems to be something that happens as a product of socialization. We learn from our parents, we learn from other people what to expect from various members of groups. Well, kids are wonderful at overhearing conversations by adults especially conversations by adults that they're not supposed to hear, they pick up this stuff and they begin to get their ideas uh, from mom and dad. Those of you of a particular age know there's a great uh, song from uh, uh, the uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, uh, musical South Pacific. You've got to be carefully taught to hate and fear the people your relatives hate and fear. And no, I'm not going to sing it to you. Um, but that's the general idea, that either through formal instruction, you've got to be carefully taught, or through some other kind of social learning process, these social stereotypes tend to be transmitted from one generation uh, to another. One interesting view of, uh, of, of social stereotypes is that they are also a product of direct experience. This is the so-called kernel of truth uh, view of stereotypes, which basically says, well, stereotypes are exaggerated, but there's something to them that Germans really are more nationalistic or really are more industrious uh, than, uh, than, every, uh, than, than, than other people. That is a view that has been popular in some quarters, but there are problems with this. And the first thing is that most people's experience with the objects of their stereotypes is incredibly limited. If you th think, for example, about the average white person's amount of contact with Black people, for example, white stereotype blacks, in case you hadn't noticed, by the way, blacks also stereotype whites. But the point is that the average black person really hasn't had that much contact with lots of black people, so you really don't know what they're like, okay? And the second point is there isn't a kernel of truth to most of these stereotypes, right? That's just untrue. Uh, uh, so what you've, got to under, you've got to try to figure out, if you've got to try to figure out where social stereotypes come from, to the extent that they're based on direct experience, how is it that people come to know things about other groups that really are not true of, uh, not true of group, um, group members? One way in which this happens is by virtue of a cognitive bias, if you will, which is known as the illusory correlation, a term that was introduced by Lauren and Jean Chapman to um, researchers uh, in, the, uh, in the 1960s, and uh, they argued that we carry around in our heads uh, co correlations that are illusory in one of two ways. Either we perceive a correlation, an association between two events or two attributes or whatever, where none exists whatsoever, or we exaggerate an existing uh, correlation. So this is a very common characteristic of, uh, of, of, of human thought, a propensity for, uh, for, uh, for these kinds of um, illusory correlations. And these illusory correlations have um, two general sources to them. One, which is quite interesting, are stereotype beliefs. Now remember, stereotype beliefs have their origins in the illusory correlation, right? And now I've just told you that illusory correlations can have their origins in stereotype beliefs. These things feed on each other, okay, in very interesting ways. So, for example, the Chapmans did a very interesting ex uh, uh, experiment in which they showed people um, responses to Rorschach ink blots. You know what Rorschach ink blots are. And they labeled some of these ink blots as uh, being produced by people with paranoid schizophrenia and other inkblot responses as, not, uh, as being produced by people without paranoid schizophrenia. Um, and uh, paranoia often has to do with suspicion and hostility and things like that. And people actually believed that eyes, eyes, that is, these things that you look out of, 
eyes appeared more, the people who were more like paranoid schizophrenics were more likely to perceive eyes in, um, in, in Rorschach ink blots uh, than non-paranoid schizophrenics, even though the data that they were presented with was constructed in such a way that eyes occurred with exactly equal frequency in the two groups, okay? But people thought, oh, paranoids are suspicious. They're going to think everybody's looking at them. So there was a belief that led people to perceive a correlation where none existed. Okay? The second feature, uh, the, the second source of illusory correlations is one that's really very interesting, which is known as the feature positive uh, effect, which is to say that we tend to pay special attention to the conjunction of unusual features. This is a characteristic of human thought, but it's also, it turns out, to be a characteristic of rat and pigeon thought. Uh, when, uh, when you try to condition uh, animals to respond to a particular stimulus, uh, they are particularly attentive to the conjunction of a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus, for example. Uh, they are not, they, it's very difficult for animals to learn about the relationship between the absence of a conditioned stimulus and the presence of an unconditioned uh, stimulus. So it turns out we've got a cognitive bias that focuses our attention on the, um, on the conjunction of unusual features, and that's something that can contribute to creating, out of whole cloth, a, uh, an illusory correlation. Here's a demonstration of this by David Hamilton and uh, his uh, student Gifford, uh, Tom Gifford. Uh, here, um, they presented subjects with a list of behaviors to study, okay? These behaviors, there were 39 of them, 27 of them, 27 of them were moderately desirable behaviors, like he's rarely late for work, which is a good thing. Um, 12 of them were moderately undesirable, like he always talks about himself. Um, and some of uh, the, these behaviors were either attributed to members, of, were, were attributed to members of one of two groups. These are artificial groups. There were 26 um, uh, of these behaviors attributed to members of group A, and 13 of these behaviors were attributed to members of group B. And the way Hamilton and Gifford constructed their study was that the group A was the, for, for group A, they listed 18 desirable behaviors and eight undesirable behaviors, a ratio of desirable to undesirable behaviors of nine to four, okay? For group B, they presented nine desirable behaviors and four undesirable behaviors. Again, a ratio of desirable to undesirable behaviors uh, of, uh, of nine to four. But notice what happens here. You've got moderately undesirable behaviors are relatively rare. Actions of group B are relatively rare. And what happened in the experiment is that people picked up and perceived an association between being in group B and displaying undesirable behaviors, even though there was no such relationship. In fact, group B engaged in fewer undesirable behaviors than group A but the ratio of desirable to undesirable behaviors was precisely the same for the two groups. There is the outcome of the study. Uh, we've got magnitude of error here, uh, classifying action types as positive uh, and negative. And what you can see here is that um, they attributed uh, more negative behaviors to members of the minority group. Now, this wasn't blacks and whites, Muslims or Christians or anything. It was just group A and group B, like in the minimal group uh, paradigm. Yet, one group was a minority group, group B. There were fewer members uh, in it. And then there were some undesirable behaviors, which it's there, kind of the nature of undesirable behaviors, that there are fewer of them around. We are basically good, okay? Um, but still, people perceived a correlation uh, between them so that when they were asked to make trade ratings of group, uh, uh, group A and group B. Subjects saw group A, the majority group, as more positive and less negative, and uh, group B as, um, uh, as, as, as more negative than group A. So here you've got the illusory correlation leading to a social stereotype, a stereotyped view of what people in group A and people in group B 
um, look like. Okay, so, and that's a pure cognitive effect. Okay, it's just the way our minds work that we pay special attention to the conjunction of unusual features. So if we see a member of a minority group engaging in rare behavior, okay, then we tend to think, oh, people like that do things like this. That's where the stereotype comes from, even though there's no evidence for that correlation in the real world. An interesting feature of social stereotypes is that they tend to be automatically elicited by the presence of a member of the stereotyped group. So if there's an outgroup member, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the member of the stereotype group present in the environment, uh, in-group members tend to start thinking about, uh, about this stereotype. You'll remember again from your introduction to cognitive science or cognitive psychology or introduction to psychology in general that automatic processes are inevitably evoked by the presence in the environment of some stimulus, okay? Once evoked, they run off to execute. They're, they're executed in a ballistic fashion. You really can't uh, stop them. They, they're effortless in the sense that they don't consume attentional uh, resources, and they tend not to interfere with other kinds of things. Automatic processes are unconscious in the strict sense of the term because automatic processes seem to operate outside of phenomenal awareness. They don't consume cognitive capacity. We're not aware of these processes operating, and they seem to operate outside voluntary control as well. Well, it turns out that stereotypes can be automatically activated by the presence of stereotype group members uh, in, uh, in the environment. Here is an interesting exa early example of this. This is work by Patricia Devine, uh, then at Ohio State, now at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, on, uh, on, on, on what she calls race-based uh, priming. In one of her studies, uh, she engaged a group of white college students uh, in a thought listing procedure in which they were simply asked to write down what the white stereotype of African Americans is. Not what they themselves believed about African, uh, the, uh, African Americans, but what their sense was of the white stereotype of African Americans. And you got the usual kind of thing uh, lots of references to things like poverty and education and intelligence and crime and athletics. That is what the, what, what, what the stereotype is uh, uh, for, uh, for worse. Um, then they engage these same subjects. Uh, then they, the, the, in, so having elicited what the contents of the African-American stereotype were, they engaged another group of white subjects uh, in, uh, in a vigilance task in which they were simply asked to uh, uh, watch a computer screen, click a, uh, click a button whenever they saw a particular, um, a particular stimulus, and uh, in the periphery there were, they, they flashed words relating to the black stereotype and masked them so that they were actually presented subliminally. Okay? Um, some subjects got just a low density of these words, only about 20% of the words pertain to the black stereotype. Other subjects got a high density of these words. About 80% of these cues uh, 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 pertain to the black stereotype. Then, after engaging in this vigilance task, subjects were asked to read one of the favorite stories in the study of social cognition known as the Donald story, which is a story about a guy named Donald. Uh, and the story simply lists a whole bunch of behaviors that Donald engaged in, which are all kind of ambiguous uh, uh, the behaviors, that uh, he refused to let a salesman into the house, okay, which could be a hostile behavior, or you could say, well, it was not a hostile behavior because he had a visitor. He refused to pay his rent, which is, again, possibly hostile uh, behavior until the landlord repainted the apartment. So there are lots of ways you could construe these behaviors as hostile versus non-hostile, but all the subjects read was, Donald refused to let the salesman into the house. Donald refused to pay his rent. Donald took his car to another mechanic, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so on, okay? So then, uh, what happened? After reading the Donald story, subjects were asked to evaluate Donald. Now, the Donald wasn't described as black or white or anything. He was just described as Donald. For all they know, he was a duck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
But it turned out that subjects who were primed with the African-American stereotype were more likely to perceive Donald as hostile than those who were not, okay? So here we have um, uh, hostility uh, uh, the ratings. These are people who got just 20% of the primes. These are people who got high density of African-American primes. And the stereotype spilled over into ratings of Donald. And uh, Devine argues that what happened was that by virtue of presenting these words that were related to the African-American stereotype, that activated the stereotype, and that it then influenced their perceptions of Donald all unconsciously, all, um, all automatically. And there are now dozens of studies like this showing that stereotypes are automatically activated in thought by the presence of, say, minority group members, and that those stereotypes can spill over into uh, impressions and perceptions uh, of, uh, of, other, you know, of other individuals. So that we've got two different kinds of processes here uh, going on. Um, it turned out, interestingly, in the Divine study, she actually measured the racial attitudes of, uh, of her subjects and found some white students who were not very prejudiced towards African Americans and others who were highly prejudiced towards African, uh, and African Americans. And what she found was that there was no difference in race-based priming between white people with low prejudice and white people with high degrees of prejudice, suggesting that maybe the prejudice itself was unconscious. It's one thing to be consciously aware of your prejudice and have it operate automatically. It's another thing not to be aware of your prejudice. She suggested that people who, had, who scored low on her, on, her, uh, on her assessment of racism but still showed large amounts of race-based priming were unconsciously uh, prejudiced. It's quite an interesting uh, kind of argument, um, uh, interesting argument to make. Okay, so, so far we've looked at stereotypes in the minds of the perceiver. What it means to say the typical German is, the Germans are industrious, okay? How stereotypes are activated automatically in the minds of the perceiver. Let's look for a moment at the effects of these stereotypes on the individuals being stereotyped. There turns out to be a lot of these. First, and most obviously, there is overt prejudice and discrimination. If we hold negative stereotypes about outgroup members, we're not going to like outgroup members, we're not going to hire them for jobs, we're not, and uh, if, we do have to, if we do come into contact with them, we're not going to treat them uh, very well. That much is obvious. What's less obvious are the ways in which stereotyped beliefs and expectations can translate into more subtle forms of behavior. So, for example, there is a fairly large literature now showing that stereotypes can, lead to, stereotypes can function as self-fulfilling prophecies. That is, holding a stereotype about some member of, about some social group may lead us, will lead us, to behave in such a way as to elicit from members of the stereotype group behaviors that confirm the stereotype. Okay? Either act behaviors that actually confirm the stereotype in what is known as behavioral confirmation or behaviors that can be interpreted as confirming the stereotype, what's known as perceptual confirmation processes. The second thing that can happen in the, to the person who's being, uh, uh, the being stereotyped is that the person can be thrown into a state of what's known as attributional ambiguity. So you've got a target who knows that he or she is the object of some kind of stereotype, okay, say a negative stereotype, but uh, the person over, uh, the, you say something nice to such a person, they don't know whether you really mean it or whether you're being condescending to them, you know. Oh, you know, you're pretty good for a man, you know, uh, which is the kind of thing that, well, men don't hear nearly as often enough. Um, but you don't know whether, you know, that that's a statement about the individual or a statement that's just meant to be condescending. Uh, for, and if you criticize a member of a stereotype group, they don't know whether you're criticizing them personally, okay, or whether 
the criticism stems simply from a stereotype. So they don't know what to make of, uh, of this behavior. Another effect of stereotypes on the target is what's known as stereotype avoidance. If people who are objects of stereotypes, obviously they know what the stereotypes are, they may avoid engaging in behaviors that could be interpreted as confirming stereotypes. So if white people, for example, have a stereotype of African Americans as very athletic, you might get some black kid who won't play basketball or football or, or whatever, precisely because he doesn't want to be perceived as, 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 uh, as confirming the stereotype. Okay? Uh, so you want to, um, the blunt expectancy confirmation um, effects. Uh, another but very subtle um, uh, 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 consequence of stereotyping is what's known as stereotype vulnerability. That is, when members uh, of stereotype social groups engage in various kinds of behaviors, they tend to feel uh, very anxious. They tend to experience high levels of frustration precisely because they know that the stereotype is at stake. And then finally, um, members of stereotype groups can experience stereotype threat, which refers to an actual reduction in performance by these individuals. Uh, here's a very quick example uh, of this by work by Claude Steele, uh, until recently was at uh, Stanford. Steele, in one of his studies, tested black and white Stanford undergraduates in a study of verbal reasoning. Um, uh, in one condition, the experiment, the subjects were told that this test will actually help us to diagnose problems that you yourself might have, okay? Or they weren't told that, or uh, the, the subjects were told, this test is an opportunity for you to show, uh, to, uh, to, to, to display your actual levels of, uh, of ability. The point of this was to invoke stereotype vulnerability and stereotype threat because the African Americans, for whatever reason, score lower on tests of various kinds of abilities than, um, than, than, than other groups. The idea here was that this would threaten, uh, threaten the, the subjects. And in fact, what happened was that the African American Stanford students actually scored lower on the test when they were subject to, 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 uh, the, to stereotype threat. There are two different studies here. Whereas when they were just told, well, this is a test of, uh, we're, we're, we're piloting a new test for the SAT or whatever, um, there, was no, there were no performance differences. So here again, you've got the stereotype working itself out in behavior, not so much through the behavior of the stereotyper, but rather through the behavior of the stereotype E. So let's just say that with, when it comes to so the stereotypes as social categories, we get to see what I think of as a kind of corollary to the Thomas theorem that I talked about before. If men define situations as real, they're real in their consequences. But if we think stereotypes are an accurate reflection of reality, they're real in their consequences too, because they can actually bring reality into congruence with our stereotypes. Beliefs can create reality. And that's true for, uh, at the individual level, and it's also true at the group level of social stereotyping. Okay, enough on social categorization. Next time we'll look at other aspects of uh, social judgment and decision-making. Thanks very much. <laughs>